Senate Foreign Relations Committee will come to order. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have uh, some business to conduct today, uh, pursuant to notice. And uh, I will note for the record that I've received a number of pieces of correspondence from uh, the uh, minority members of the committee. And I want to address a few of things there before we move uh, forward. Uh, First of all, uh, some members have raised the question of the uh, uh, health of the committee, but uh, I would tell you that uh, uh, your chairman is as concerned as anyone with uh, uh, the COVID situation. As a result of that, we consulted very, very, very closely with the uh, uh, attending physician's office. As we all know, the attending physician's office has cleared a handful of rooms for us to meet in. This is one of them. I've seen a number of you in uh, other committee meetings in, uh, in similar situations. I want to commend the, the attending physician for uh, the work that he's done, and we're following scrupulously uh, the attending physician's recommendations. Secondly, a question was raised about the notice of this meeting. I've reviewed carefully Rule 3D, as I did uh, uh, prior to noticing the meeting. Uh, under Rule 3D, it is the ruling of the chair that pro the meeting has been properly noticed. Uh, some of you have asked that there be a video, not some of you, all of the Democrats have asked that there be a video link to this meeting. Ordinarily, we would be holding this business meeting in room 116. As we all know, room 116 is not connected uh, video, uh, but uh, nor is it connected uh, audio uh, to streaming. But uh, in the spirit of compromise, uh, I've authorized this uh, meeting to be uh, audio streamed. Um, next, uh, you've raised the fact that the, on the eve of the last uh, meeting before I postponed it, we received a letter from the uh, Attorney General of the District of Columbia uh, claiming an investigation regarding uh, Mr. Pack's nomination or Mr. Pack's uh, company. Um, having had uh, uh, significant experience with this on the Ethics Committee, uh, where uh, the uh, Justice Department has asked us to stand down. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing that we've done in the Ethics Committee, and that is if the United States uh, Attorney General and Department, and Department of Justice asks us to stand down, we will do so. Uh, that has not happened here. Uh, the Attorney General of the D of District of Columbia will be uh, given access to uh, the public documents that are there. As far as documents that are not public, I will uh, confer with the uh, with counsel and uh, make a ruling as far as those documents are concerned. Uh, I note that this is a particularly partisan matter. Uh, we are going to consider the uh, nomination of Michael Pack, uh, which has been pending for uh, just uh, shy of two years. And uh, the chairman believes it's time to move forward on this. Uh, the hallmarks of this committee have always been civility, kindness, understanding, and tolerance. And we'd ask us to double down on that hallmark as we go forward with this. Uh, with that, uh, the uh, matter before the committee is the nomination of Michael Pack. Uh, Mr. The chairman. Cha Mr. Chairman. The chair, please don't interrupt right now. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have, Senator, always, I have always seen the ranking member be able to give an opening statement at any style. We're not I'm going to have that. I'm going to call on you in just a moment, Senator. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, right now, I'm going to entertain a motion to uh, so moved. Send, send Mr. Pack out to, to be confirmed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, He's Mr. Been moved Chairman, by Senator the, 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 the statement second? of a ranking member comes before any action of the committee. This is unprecedented. I have never, ever, when I was chairman or any other previous chairman, Democrat or Republican, silenced a ranking member before the committee's action. Thank you, Senator. Is there a second to Senator Brasso's motion? Mr. Chairman, I must object motion strenuously. Been, the motion has been made and seconded. What one so one Bra sees. Senator Menendez, you have the floor. Uh, I have two preliminary matters that I want to address. As an initial matter, I ask you for unanimous consent to enter into the record of this meeting a number of items related to the nomination of Michael Pack. These materials include letters from all of the Democratic members of the committee to you, Mr. Chairman, letters to former White House Acting Chief of Staff Mulvaney, 
and current Chief of Staff medals concerning Mr. Pack. Letters between Mr. Pack and myself, my QFRs to Pack and his responses and other items. I have a hard copy of each item with me, but in light of the current precautions due to COVID-19, uh, I would be pleased to submit these documents electronically to the Chief. So I ask unanimous consent that they be included. It will be included. Secondly, I'm deeply troubled by the fact and uh, our discussions with the parliamentarian, the Rules Committee, indicate a totally different set of circumstances. That this business meeting is available to the American people and the rest of the world only through audio. Every other committee that I have been on and that I have observed is conducting its hearings and or its meetings with video as well as audio stream. If you are deaf, an audio stream does nothing for you at the end of the day. Violates the Americans with Disabilities Act. Violates the rules from my perspective. I'm even more troubled by the fact that you've blocked a video live stream despite multiple requests for video, including all 10 members of the minority. For a committee that promotes transparency, good governance, the rule of law around the world, open societies, it's ironic, it's ironic that you as chairman are preventing the public from viewing this meeting. So certainly uh, it's unprecedented. Now, Mr. Chairman, we're facing an unpre unprecedented crisis. We're in the midst of a global pandemic which has taken more than 80,000 American lives, threatens to take tens of thousands more. Across the world, millions of people may die. The international community is banding together to find solutions to this deadly virus. It is in times like these that senators from both parties have put their political differences aside to come together to pursue our best interests, to help give our government the tools it needs to best serve Americans and present a united front to the world. And this committee has played a central role in these moments. In this moment, we should be utilizing all of our collective resources to marshal a strong and effective response on behalf of the American people. We should be holding hearings on how to craft a bipartisan response that will save lives and help restart the economy in this country and around the world. We should be working together to craft bipartisan legislation that will ensure that the United States government is appropriately organized and sufficiently funded to impact the global response to COVID. But that's not what we're doing. This committee has not held any COVID-related hearings. And despite my repeated request, there has been no meaningful committee consideration of COVID legislation. Committee Democrats have put forward a strong and comprehensive vision. We had hoped to work with you on the COVID-19 International Response and Recovery Act. Since that was not possible, we introduced the bill three weeks ago and urge you multiple times, Mr. Chairman, to include it in this markup. Beyond not even allowing it on the agenda, we understand that you may not even be willing to allow a COVID-related debate and amendment process at today's meeting. Mr. Chairman, simply not right. The only way the committee can meet the challenge of COVID is if you lead in a bipartisan way, and we are eager for you to do so. To the extent we were in normal circumstances, the legislative agenda would be a good one. These are solid bipartisan bills, and I have been asking for many of them to be taken up for over a year. Uh, I would also urge you to take up Senator Young and Van Hollen's New START legislation. Uh, Senator Young, as we recall, agreed to withdraw his bill as an amendment to another piece of legislation at the last business meeting six months ago after you committed to marking it up at a future business meeting, and I hope uh, that you will honor that commitment. Similarly, Senator Cardin has been seeking a markup of his bipartisan legislation. I want to work with you and him to make that happen at the next business meeting. And I know that there are many others on this committee with priorities who wish to see a more active legislative agenda. Now, I understand that it is your intention to pass most of these items on today's agenda in block, and that you may not consider any other piece of legislation that have amendments. Uh, to me, that is simply unacceptable. To sit idle for six months and then effectively tell members of this committee they cannot offer amendments to legislation, that's not an approach that we can abide by. Finally, Mr. Chairman, in this moment where we should be coming together to fight COVID, 
We are unfortunately being driven apart by your handling of the Michael Pack nomination. Under both Republicans and Democrats, this committee operated under the principle of comedy. That means we did things together. We found common ground, and we resolved problems through bipartisanship. This does mean we, doesn't mean that we voted the same way on everything, but the chairman respected the role and rights of the minority party. This is the third time that you have broken comedy in this Congress. The first two times, we urged you to step back from the brink, and we tried to reach an accommodation that kept the spirit of comedy alive, even if only on life support. When I was the chairman of this committee, at the request of then-ranking member Corker, I didn't move my own State Department authorization bill. At the request of the ranking member, and despite pressure from a Democratic White House, I didn't move nominees who I believe were qualified and who I strongly supported. I respected the committee and upheld comedy. And I respected the Senate as an independent and co-equal branch of government. And I was not alone. On a bipartisan basis, Democrats and Republicans alike carried on the best traditions of this committee. Corker, Kerry, Biden, Luger, and so on. They all respected comedy, and they did it because it was right. They did it because it was effective. And they did it because when we work together, American foreign policy is stronger. But now, Mr. Chairman, you're ending that bipartisan legacy. You did nothing to defend historical bipartisan committee or Senate prerogatives when Michael Pack broke his commitment to me and refused to engage in good faith on serious vetting issues. You failed to even respond to the concerns of the entire Democratic membership of the committee when all 10 of us objected to noticing PACT and asked for a second hearing or a closed discussion. And now you have put him up for a vote a second time with only two days' notice, despite the continued objection of all Democratic members and some shocking new developments in the PACT saga. At your request, Mr. Chairman, I met with Michael Pack last year. He may not have been my chosen nominee, but in the interest of ensuring leadership at critical agencies last fall, I cleared him to advance in the nominations process. However, on the eve of his hearings last year, new problematic information came to light concerning his taxes and other serious background issues. In the spirit of cooperation, I felt it would be unfair to raise such issues publicly until he had an opportunity to address them privately. So at his hearing, I asked for his commitment to providing uh, prompt and complete responses on those issues. At the time, he promised to do so. But in the end, he never engaged with the committee in good faith. His responses to my questions were perfunctory and self-serving. He refused to provide any of the requested documentation that could have verified those responses if they were actually truthful. So what do we know about Mr. Pack? Let's start with the issues that my staff and I have been raising with you, with Mr. Pack and the White House for the last eight months. We know that for years, he misrepresented the relationship between his nonprofit organization and his for-profit company to the IRS. His film company received millions in grants from his nonprofit, yet he repeatedly told the IRS that there was no relationship between them when, in fact, he ran them both. Mr. Pack admitted that he gave false information to the IRS, but he has refused to correct his past filings. Even after acknowledging this, he still wrote in his questionnaire to this committee that his tax returns are complete and accurate when he knew, he knew that was not the case. In other words, he lied to the committee. Mr. Pack has also refused to provide basic information that would shed light on whether the transactions between the nonprofit and his business were above board, claiming that they were too sensitive for members of this committee to see. Really? These agreements between two sides of Mr. Pack's business interests are so sensitive that the United States senators cleared to review the most sensitive classified information cannot see them? Colleagues, I'm on a loss here. These are some of uh, the most basic questions that we ask of all nominees and the minimum standard we use to ask them to meet. Provide accurate information to the IRS 
provide accurate information to the committee, don't lie. Is there a reason that Mr. Pack does not need to meet the basic standards of everyone, every other nominee before this committee? I know there was a time that my colleagues used to care about tax issues. I've seen, I've been here long enough to see many nominees, very qualified individuals, be disqualified by virtue of tax issues, including the former uh, majority leader of the United States Senate. But we seem to not care about these tax issues at all. And I'm not just speaking about the tax issue. There are a range of other serious uh, background problems that implicate Mr. Pack's fitness to serve. Uh, but I, I fear that you and the White House have looked the other way. So that brings us up to May 7th, when you first notice Mr. Pack for a committee vote over our strenuous objection. So it was a notice that broke comedy. We did not agree. But it is not the end of this adventure. You scheduled the original vote on May 14th. Had we taken that vote and we came within hours of doing so, it would have likely been before members of this committee knew that Mr. Pack is under investigation by the Attorney General for the District of Columbia for the very same allegations of self-dealing and self-enrichment that I have been highlighting for you since last year. Just think about that. You almost had the members of the committee voting on a nominee only to learn hours later that he is under investigation and subject to subpoena issued by the lead law enforcement agency in the very jurisdiction in which the Senate sits. And not only is the D.C. Attorney General's office investigating Mr. Pack, it has reached out to ask us for the committee's assistance. I have made it absolutely clear publicly and in communications with you and the Senate Legal Counsel that we need to cooperate with this request, this committee and the Senate as a whole. We owe it to the American people to be transparent and promote the rule of law. So I was stunned and saddened to see that before the Senate Legal Counsel even had an opportunity to respond, to provide us guidance, and before we had an opportunity to jointly engage the D.C. Attorney General and learn more about the investigation, you rescheduled the vote on PAC, and you did so with only two days' notice. So I have to ask, what could possibly be so urgent about Mr. PAC that this single nomination uh, that we are so desperate to move him forward. You have stated that your standard for nominees with serious vetting problems, nominees that would have previously never been submitted to the Senate or received a committee vote, is to gather all the information and then get it to the public and let the chips fall where they may. But we haven't even lived up to your own standard. We simply don't have all the information on PAC. So I ask my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, why are we doing this? Why are we voting on a nominee who has not been honest with the committee? Why are we voting on a nominee who has not been honest with the United States government? Why are we voting on a nominee who is the subject of an investigation for unlawful self-enrichment? Is this really the person you want running a U.S. government agency with a budget of almost a billion dollars? And what does this say to the American people? How can they trust this committee and what should they have faith in that Mr. Pack will not use taxpayer dollars for his own benefit? At this point, uh, let me raise one conspiracy theory circling around the internet, a conspiracy theory that sadly may very well be repeated at this meeting. It goes something like this. The chairman had no choice but to schedule a vote on Mr. Pack because the pending investigation is quote unquote politically motivated, as evidenced by a letter from me to the DC Attorney General and that the D.C. Attorney General is only investigating Mr. Pack because I asked him to do so. So colleagues, please. I did write to the Attorney General. I did so eight months after Mr. Pack's suspect business practices were exposed, not by me, but by the so-called mainstream media, CNBC, hardly a liberal bastion. I did so eight months after Mr. Pack committed publicly to answer my questions about these allegations and then promptly refused to do so. I did so eight months after repeatedly asking you and the White House to address these allegations. Absolutely, I wrote a letter to the D.C. Attorney General, the lead law enforcement official in the very jurisdiction in which the Senate sits. In that letter, I explained my concerns over what I have been trying to get to the bottom of not because of politics, but because the chairman and the ranking member of this committee have a duty to ensure nominees are fit for office. 
not to rubber stamp them regardless of whatever baggage they bring to the table. And I got a response from Mr. Racine. Let me quote from it. Based on public reporting and publicly available materials, my office was already aware of issues similar to those discussed in your letter, and we share your concerns. We currently have an open investigation into these concerns under our Nonprofit Corporations Act authority." Close quote. So the D.C. Attorney General was already conducting their investigation, already aware of Mr. Pack's legal problems before receiving my letter, and he already had an open investigation into Mr. Pack prior to my letter. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, that is what I did, and I'm happy to answer any questions about it. But now, let's ask, what did you do? I think the committee would benefit from a better understanding of what specific steps you took to address this issue and Mr. Pack's other unresolved background problems. What steps did you take to require Mr. Pack to correct his false statements to the committee? What steps did you require Mr. Pack to correct his false statements to the IRS and provide the U.S. government with legally required disclosures? What steps did you take to ensure that we were not moving forward with a nominee who has violated the law? We have a constitutional duty. If advice and consent means anything, at a minimum, at rock bottom, it means ensuring that people we confirm are suitable for that public service. And if they're not, we don't move forward. So before concluding, I must note that the fact that this committee is about to vote on a nominee under investigation is not the only highly disturbing development of the week. As we have seen, Secretary Pompeo has taken the drastic and likely self-interested step of causing the firing of the State Department Inspector General. This committee needs to be addressing that matter on an urgent basis. So, Mr. Chairman, to get this business meeting moving in a bipartisan direction and to ensure that the meeting does not end before we take up the business of the American people, I think we need an order of business for this meeting that reflects the priorities of the American people. Accordingly, I move that we establish an order of business for this meeting as follows, that the committee first take up and vote S-3667, the Consular and Administrative Authorities Act, and the COVID amendments filed for that bill, that we turn to the other important national security and foreign policy legislative items in the agenda, and that the consideration of the nomination of Michael Pack be postponed. I so move it. Is there a second? been moved and seconded uh, that uh, the uh, uh, ranking member order the meeting according to his wishes. I'll be opposing the motion. Secretary, will, our clerk will call the roll, please. No by proxy. No by proxy. Aye. Aye. Aye by proxy. Aye by proxy. No. Motion is failed. Is there further debate? Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Senator Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm going to uh, move in one moment that we go into a closed session. And let me give my reasons first. Mr. Pax, a Maryland resident. I think the issues that have been raised by Senator Menendez, we need to have a discussion among ourselves. This committee works in a historic bipartisan manner. I think it would be extremely healthy for us to have a private discussion uh, before we act on this nominee as it relates to this nominee and the process that's being used uh, that has the uh, Democrats uh, really so upset. I think for the sake of this nominee and for the sake of the comedy of this committee, it would be useful for ha us to have that discussion. And therefore, Mr. Chairman, I move that pursuant to our House rules, we go into a closed session. Would you accept a unanimous consent request to do that, Senator Cardin? Sure.
Senator Cardin's asked unanimous consent that we go into a closed session. Is there objection? Hearing none, it is be so ordered. The media will be escorted respectfully from the room. Uh, the video audio feed will be turned off. We will proceed into a closed session. Uh, we have been uh, rejoined uh, electronically. Uh, we've completed our closed session. And uh, Senator Kuntz, you have a motion to make, as I understand. Is that correct? I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move that we postpone this committee's vote uh, on the nomination of Michael Pack until he corrects the statements that he's made to this committee. Uh, as we um, have all discussed, there are several years in his submitted nonprofit tax filings uh, where he has admitted errors. And I think that is a long-standing tradition and practice of this committee that we do not advance um, confirmation votes on nominees where we know that they have failed to meet some of the most basic betting requirements. I ask for the yeas and nays. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Second. The motion has been duly made and seconded that we postpone the vote. Uh, I will be voting no, of course. The clerk uh, will call the roll, please. No by proxy. No by proxy. Aye. Aye. Aye by proxy. Aye by proxy. No. Motion's failed. Is there further debate on the uh, nomination? Senator Menendez. Mr. Chairman, before I make the following motion, I just want to preface it. The reason I'm about to make this motion, which is to postpone the committee's uh, vote on the nomination of Michael Pack until Mr. Pack corrects his tax filings with the IRS and provides evidence of such to the committee, is that from all of uh, the documents that we have reviewed, it appears that Mr. Pack transferred nearly $4.3 million from his nonprofit that he totally controls to his for-profit company, which he totally controls. The result of that uh, creates uh, the real possibility of uh, tax consequences and liabilities, as well as misfilings with the IRS. Uh, as such, it seems to me that he should correct, as we have asked him, to correct his tax filings with the IRS and provide evidence as such to this committee. So I move that the committee postpone the vote on the nomination of Michael Pack until he corrects his tax filings with the IRS and provides evidence as such to the committee. There's been a motion uh, made in a second. Uh, the the uh, motion in, uh, is the same as the motion made by Senator Kuntz, uh, but for different reasons. I'm going to allow a vote on this one, but uh, we're, we're not going to uh, we're not going to uh, just uh, keep spinning the wheels. So, uh, with that, uh, clerk will uh, call the roll. No by proxy. No by proxy. Aye. Aye by proxy. Aye by proxy. Aye by proxy. No. Yeas are 10, noes are 12, motions failed. Further debate? Mr. Chair. Who's, who's seeking raise? Oh, Senator King. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to make a motion and ask for a voice vote on it. I would move that the uh, 
vote on the nomination be postponed until we can have a closed hearing and ask Mr. Peck about these matters directly. Uh, they were not known to the committee when he was before us. No one's had the chance to have a direct interaction with him. They're sensitive matters, and I think the, it would be respectful to him, but necessary for the committee to allow us to now inquire into them. Uh, and that is my motion, uh, and I would be glad to take a voice vote on it. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made, and I'll, uh, and uh, duly seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay? The uh, nays have it. The motion has failed. Further debate? Uh, se uh, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to make a, a, a similar but slightly different motion. Um, given the fact that the promises made in that open hearing to Senator Menendez uh, were not fulfilled, that he has not produced any of those documents, and that these allegations are serious and frankly, very much germane to the job in which uh, Mr. Pack is going to take. He is going to be controlling uh, millions of dollars that can be awarded to uh, outside for-profit film companies. Um, it seems as if this should be something we should also have the chance to talk to him about in an open hearing. He did not get asked these questions in his hearing before us, in large part because of a promise he made to deal forthrightly with the committee, in particular with the ranking member uh, afterwards. And so um, I would make uh, a motion uh, and a um, voice vote is fine as well to postpone the committee vote on Mr. Pack and move for a new hearing, a uh, public hearing in this case, so that the committee can examine these questions and information that's come to light on his fitness for confirmation. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Noes have it. The motion has failed. For further debate. Mr. Chairman, uh, I move to postpone the committee vote on the nomination of Michael Pack until the D.C. Attorney General completes its investigation into Mr. Pack. And I ask for a recorded vote. Is there a second? Uh, again, uh, this is, uh, by my count, fourth or fifth motion to postpone. Uh, very similar reasons on each one. I'm going to allow a vote, but this isn't going to go on very long. The clerk will uh, call the roll, please, on the motion. No, by proxy. by proxy. Aye by proxy. I'm sorry. I, uh, I heard another name. I by proxy. No. Nays are 12, A's are 10, motion has failed. Is there further debate? There'd be no further debate. The question Mr. is Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Uh, Senator Merkley. Mr. Chairman, I move to postpone the committee vote on Michael Pack until we receive determination from other relevant jurisdictions as to whether he is subject to other investigations. This could be relevant in California, in Maryland, or even under federal uh, entities, and it's important to have that information before we proceed. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Th this is the last motion I'm going to accept on, uh, on postponing it. Uh, the, the, the motions are getting dilatory. I want to give everybody the opportunity to have it, but this is, uh, by my count, uh, fifth or sixth motion we've had in this regard. Uh, so given that, uh, this will be the last motion to postpone. Everybody vote appropriately. The clerk will call the roll. No more proxy. Aye. Aye by proxy. Aye 
Aye, by proxy. Aye. No. Roll call is uh, nays 12, ayes aye. The motion is failed. So for the debate. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Senator Menendez. I have one more motion uh, to postpone the committee vote. These, these postponements are for different reasons, I would note to the chair. Uh, on the nomination of Mr. Pack until he provides information regarding the contract between the nonprofit Claremont Institute and Mr. Pack's for profit fill company, Manifold Production. Yeah. I'm going to rule the motion out of order as dilatory. We've, we've had. Uh, Under uh, what basis is the motion out of order, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman? The motion is, uh, uh, not, is out of order because it's dilatory. We've had six or eight motions on that. So is there further debate? There's been, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, there's been no motion that specifically asks that the postponement of the nomination be contingent upon the nominee providing contract information between the Claremont Institute and his for-profit company, Manifold Production. Uh, Senator, I will allow one more vote uh, so long as everyone who wants this postponed will state their reasons and we can vote for them all, on, uh, all at one time. This is the last vote we're going to have. Is it, is, it, it is dilatory. Mr. Chairman. So, Senator Rupert. It, perhaps this question is a parliamentary inquiry of the clerk. Can, can we, is there a count now of how many votes we've taken on a motion to postpone? I don't have a complete, uh, uh, clerk, uh, do you have a? I'm sorry? Seven uh, motions, yeah. last one. Uh, anybody who wants to get on the motion and add reasons for postponement, please say so. Senator Murphy. Mr. Chairman, I mean, I think this is a fairly extraordinary precedent that you're setting here. Um, you're suggesting that seven motions that have taken a grand total of 15 minutes um, are dilatory in nature and now robs from rank-and-file members the ability to make future mo motions on a nomination to head an agency that controls a $750 million budget. Just because they fail doesn't mean that they are necessarily dilatory or out of order. What's to then stop uh, the chairman from preventing our ability to call amendments on legislation if a uh, series of our amendments fail and postpone the passage of the legislation. Um, I mean, had we been here for four hours, uh, maybe I could understand a decision by the chair to order amend uh, motions ceased because of their dilatory nature. But uh, by my count, this has taken about 15 to 20 minutes. And I don't know, as a rank and file member who wants the ability to offer motions and amendments, I just really worry and I want to put on the record my concerns about the precedent that's being set. Thank I understand you. that you do not like these motions, um, but I don't think you can suggest that they're dilatory given the amount of time that they've taken. Well, Senator, the, uh, uh, you should note, first of all, there's been seven. Secondly, all seek the same relief. Uh, and thirdly, the vote has been exactly the same on all of them. Now, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's fair that people have their, their say. Uh, the senators made a motion to, uh, to uh, 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 delay the vote, Any, and I'm giving anyone the opportunity to get their reasons on in addition to those. But uh, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I want to be fair on this, but, and, and seven is certainly fair. But, uh, I understand, yeah. but the, the decision by the chair to shut down the ability of members of this I'm, committee I'm not to offer to motions or amendments and to rule them out of order. I, I just, as, as someone who sits down at the bottom of the, uh, of the dais here, whether it's a Republican or Democratic chair making that decision, um, I, I think it's an unnecessary one and one that comes with dangerous precedent moving forward. Mr. Right. Chairman, I understand there's a motion pending and I think it's there is a, a second day. Uh, I'd like to speak to, to it for a moment and just simply say, I would just say to my colleagues uh, I know there's a degree of silence here, uh, but understand that whatever precedents you've set here, if a majority changes, and someday it will, they're going to follow those precedents. Do you really want that? Do you remember a time when you might have been in the minority? 
Do you really want that? Do you really want not to be able to make motions? Do you really want not to offer amendments? Do you really want no comedy? Do you really want, at the end of the day, hearings to be noticed and uh, nominees to be noticed without the agreement of whoever your ranking member has given a time? That's what you're setting the foundation for here. And so, uh, you know, the one thing I, I definitely have about me that is a Republican trait is my elephant memory, for good and for bad. Mr. So Chairman. I, I, hope, I hope at the end of the day you think about what precedent you're setting here in terms of the future. And it really is incumbent upon all of us to try to preserve it. I've worked my, uh, you know, incredibly hard to try to preserve it, but when it seems that there's an issue for which comedy can no longer be observed, we break comedy. Well, then that's not comedy. It's not comedy while we, in fact, uh, you know, it's to our advantage. Uh, and then break it when it's not to our advantage. So I, I just urge members to remember that, in fact, you're setting the foundation, whether it's on votes, on motions, on amendments, on how we conduct these hearings, on when we hold a hearing, what's the agenda, you're setting that. Mr. Mr. Romney. Mr. Chairman, uh, comedy works both ways. And, and when people raise the same issue again and again and again and again, with the certain knowledge of the same outcome again and again and again, it's clear that the intent is not to engage one another across a, uh, an aisle uh, in looking for a common solution, but it is instead to, um, to try and delay for, for some other purpose. Uh, comedy respects the uh, integrity of one another, the integrity of people's time and their, their interests. It's clear that the, a number of people have looked at these issues and have reached their own conclusion. And that's why they're voting the way they are. And so continuing to, to bring up issues that could be packaged together with objections for proceeding to a vote, that's a very appropriate uh, amendment to bring. But putting the objections together so that we could vote at one time would be the kind of comedy that's associated with, uh, with any, uh, any uh, uh, body, I would think. So uh, I fully support um, encouraging anybody who has a reason to uh, delay this vote further to bring that forward so that in this this you've indicated this final vote uh, that we'll we'll be able to make that determination thank you mr chairman thank you senator romney uh, also on the matter of comedy let me uh, state in the record and i think i've said this publicly and i'm going to say it again the first time i met uh, with the ranking member we talked about uh, how to run the committee and to do it with comedy and uh, to try to get along uh, I was informed by the ranking member that his view of comedy was that uh, any time that I wanted to put something on the, uh, on the agenda that he had the opportunity to veto it. Um, I indicated I wouldn't agree to that. This is my 40th year in a Senate, uh, including both state and federal. Never heard of the uh, fact that, a, that the uh, ranking member could uh, actually uh, run the committee by taking something off of the uh, uh, off of the uh, agenda, but I told them I would work with them and I have done so, but occasionally you get to one where as chairman uh, you exercise the prerogative and that's how I'm going to do this is, uh, as long as I'm chairman of the committee and uh, I, I want to work with the minority, but uh, on the other hand I think uh, the chairman has the ability to set the agenda and to put things on the agenda that uh, the chairman deems appropriate or else the chairman isn't the chairman. Mr. So chairman. in the event uh, I want to get you Senator Cruz. Mr. Chairman, several of the members from the other side of the aisle have suggested uh, that, that not allowing them to make an infinite number of dilatory motions is the same thing as denying amendments on substantive legislation. And just for a point of clarification, those are completely and utterly different. If we were taking up legislation, I, I would strongly support any member's right to offer amendments, even if I disagreed with the amendments that you have a right to offer an amendment and have it voted, and assuming it, they were substantively different amendments, to continue offering amendments uh, and get a vote on that. In this case, we've had now eight votes on the identical motion, delay the vote. We understand now that, that the Democratic members of this committee want to delay the vote. We voted on that eight separate times. A uh, number of people around this table have tried cases in a court of law. If you, if you stood up in a court of law and made the same damn motion eight times in a row, and it was rejected eight times in a row, and if you kept doing it, you'd be held in contempt. 
Uh, and so I, I think the chair is entirely right. I also think this is a standard that would be applied on both sides. If a Republican member of this committee decided to file a, an amendment to carve Ronald Reagan into Mar Mount Rushmore, and that was voted down, and that Republican member kept filing the same motion 42 times, I have every confidence the chairman at some point would say, this is dilatory, your, your, um, your motion has been voted on, it's been rejected, let's move on. And so I commend the chairman for moving on. Mr. Chairman, one final remark since my, uh, uh, you invoked me uh, as a uh, Senator part of the Shaheen. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Asked to be recognized. Um, <clears throat> well, I, Senator Cruz, I appreciate your willingness to stand up for everyone being able to make motions to amend, to amend. And I think that is an important tenet for all of us to support. I, I think, though, what's going on here is something more than just um, filing motions to be dilatory. I mean, the reason we're trying to express our concerns about Michael Pack is because we think it's setting a really dangerous precedent for this committee. Because as I, as I interpret what we're doing today, and as I said, I'm not, I wasn't opposed to him. I wasn't planning to vote for him until the investigative issues came up. And I think that sets a serious precedent that what we're saying now is we, any nominee for a position within government can have serious issues that are being investigated, that are unresolved, and we're going to go ahead and move them regardless of what those issues are. That's not a precedent that I want to support. And I think that's why you're hearing from all of us that we have concerns about this. It's not, I mean, I'm not trying to be obstructionist. I've worked with the chairman and the ranking member in other capacities, and we've worked very well together. But I am trying, I think it is important for us, because of this legitimate concern, that we make the point that this is not a position that I think we want the committee to be in. So, you know, I, I'm not trying to be dilatory, but I do think it's important to say I don't believe that we should vote for a nominee of either party as long as they are under investigation. I can tell you on the Ethics Committee, I don't think we would recommend that. And so I, I just, I think that's why you're, you're hearing the concern that each of us are expressing today. Mr. Chairman, two final points. Senator Menendez. To my dear friend, the Senator from Utah. Uh, each, while the motions have had the same end result required, they've been offered for different reasons. And the reasons they're not lumped together is just like when we have amendments. You could have five, six, seven amendments to a specific piece of legislation, and you won't necessarily amalgamate them all and offer them all together. Why? Because you might find comedy with somebody on one of the element of what you're trying to amend, but if you put all the other ones that they're not willing to support, then you lose. So very often what we have seen in the amendment process, for example, is to the same piece of legislation, a series of amendments. Uh, and you hopefully attract a colleague uh, who might disagree with you in general, but on an amendment. These motions specifically each call for a different, the same result, but a different reason. Postpone it until you get this, until you get a second hearing. Postpone it until you get documentation. Postpone it until an investigation is over. Now, it didn't attract any support, but they were all for different reasons. And the same thing in an amendment process. You could say your amendments are being dilatory, but in fact you're breaking up your amendments because you might find somebody who accepts one of your amendments but dis dispels the other four. So I would just, just to your attention. And the final point, I never told you, Mr. Chairman, that I had a veto. You came to me, and in good faith, we spoke about how the committee process had worked, and I asked you very simply, are you going to observe comedy? And you said, well, what does that mean? And I explained exactly how it happened since I got on this committee through Democratic and Republican uh, chairmen. 
And you said, does that mean the minority has a veto? I said, no, it doesn't mean we have a veto. It means we work together to come to a solution as to how we're going to proceed on any piece of legislation or nominee, even if we don't agree on the final result of that. That's not a veto. That's a process and work. So uh, I have a different recollection. I never said we had a veto. You interpreted the reality of such a process to be a veto. But as I pointed out at the very beginning of this hearing, I did not even put my own state reauthorization bill because Bob Corker didn't want to agree to put it on the agenda. I did not put up Obama nominees who I thought were qualified because he would not agree because I didn't want to break comedy. That's what comedy was all about. Now, you might want to call that a veto. If that was a veto, then I guess I accepted a veto. I accepted comedy. And so this now has broken down where, in fact, when there is an insistence to move either a piece of legislation for before it can be worked on to a point that it be at least acceptable for amendments and or a nominee before the information is fully there, that then we say, sorry, your opinion doesn't matter. Well, that's not what I did when I was chairman. That's not what other chairmen did. I understand it. that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. But we set a precedent for the future. I think it's a precedent none of us really want. Thank you, Senator. Mr. I don't, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you do that, let me respond briefly, Senator Johnson. I don't, I don't view this as being uh, comparable to motions to amend. Uh, if you make a motion to amend uh, and you have a specific amendment, the result of a, of a yay or nay vote on that is very different. That is, at the end of the day, you may have a, a bill that uh, is, is uh, altered by the amendment process. On a motion to uh, uh, put off the vote and postpone the vote, the result's exactly the same on every single motion. So again, this is our eighth one. Anybody who wants to postpone for any possible reason, this, is your, this will be your chance when you vote. Senator Johnson. And Mr. Chairman, first of all, I think you've shown a great deal of patience in this discussion. The, the minority's views are well known. They've laid out all the reasons. Uh, they put them on the record. Uh, again, this is the eighth vote. The result is obvious. We know what it's going to be. But I, I want to address the point of precedent because I don't want to accept the fact that we're setting precedents here. There's a unique set of circumstances, and we're going to vote. It's a unique nominee, and we're going to vote. We're not setting any precedents here other than the fact that at some point in time, once the result is just obvious, you move on. You don't keep a process going on ad, ad infinitum when you end up knowing what the result is. So we're not setting any precedents here. We're going to vote on a unique set of circumstances and a unique nominee, and I would suggest we get on it and get it done and let's vote. Okay, on the final vote, uh, Senator Merkley. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I can't agree with my colleague who says no precedents are being set. We're examining the question on whether promised documents were delivered, and they have not been, and we're saying it's okay to go forward if the committee affirms this nominee. We have a, a nominee under investigation for potentially criminal conduct. This vote does set a precedent that the majority of this, this committee may be saying, if they vote in affirmative, that's okay. I, we have other key pieces that have been raised in these different amendments. Each of those is a serious and separate issue that would be addressed separately. If the vote was that he needed to correct his tax filings before we considered him, that is different than whether or not he needs to provide key documents. It is a different path that's being laid out with each of these amendments. But no one can accurately say that this is not setting new ground for this committee that will affect the future. Thank you. Uh, on the final motion to postpone, uh, the clerk will call the roll. I'm sorry, what is the present uh, vote being taken on? What is the, is there, is it? The motion is to uh, postpone the vote. Oh, aye. Right. Aye. 
I by proxy. I by proxy. No. The uh, roll call is uh, uh, 12 no. Mr. Anyone? Chairman, Mr. Chairman, it's Corey. Uh, Senator Booker. Thank you for uh, recognizing. Um, I want to say at the top, I don't have a motion to postpone, but I would like to make a motion. Um, you know, this is my, one of my favorite experiences as a senator because this is the committee where we have just tremendous bipartisan work, and I'm really proud of a lot of the work I've done, and I know I'm the least in seniority here, and uh, I've just been grateful for the relationships that I've deepened with members on both sides of the aisle. And it, this is a very disappointing moment for me um, because I do think that there's a precedent being set. And, and I'm wondering if maybe as a default, or at least as a consolation to the good faith comments by the minority, some of my members here have expressed that they were prepared to vote for this person, but for the controversy, and I think it's hard to say that this is not a controversy. Many of us have been involved in nonprofits. The fact pattern here to me is disturbing at the very least, or and suspect at the very least. And, and, and I don't think it actually is a modeling the ethics of people on both sides of the aisle. But there's something deeper that I do think is a bit of precedent setting is the fact that when this nominee submitted for the record statements that we now see were untrue, whether they were intentionally untrue or not intentionally untrue, I know Senator Menendez and others have asked him to correct the record, and he has refused to do that. That, that seems to me to be disrespecting this entire committee. If there's something that, that is factually untrue in the record that he submitted, he should be asked to correct the record. And, and so that's problematic to me, and I, and I think, again, there's a lot of just goodwill on this committee. So correct me if I'm wrong, I don't have as much experience on this committee as others, but. Can, we, can I propose a motion that at least we, as a team here, as a, as a committee, say it's a sense of the committee that this nominee, before their vote on the floor of the Senate, simply corrects the record out of a matter of respect to this body and who we are, that we should have a truthful accounting in the responses that he gave? Is this a motion to postpone, Senator? Sir, it is not a motion to postpone. It what is, is a motion to offer the sense of this committee that if there are factual, known factual errors in the record that he, in the responses to committee questions, that he simply correct the record before he, before the vote takes place on the Senate floor. Uh, Senator, I'm going to consider that a motion to postpone. We've had eight motions to postpone, and I'm just not prepared to take another motion out at some point in time. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may, if I may just sincerely, in my hope that this, I, I, I don't question your good. If I could finish my, my, my statement, I know you don't question Please. my integrity, sir. I know you, you're incredibly respectful to me always. Uh, it is not a motion to postpone. It is just a sense of this committee, in no way having any binding nature. But perhaps we could speak into the annals of history and just say, this committee believes that people should respond honestly, truthfully, and fully to the questions asked by this committee. That, that should be something that is not controversial. In no way binding, you're moving this to the floor of the Senate. But can't we, as a committee, find that comedy that we agree that it's just the sense of this committee that people should be responding truthfully and accurately if there is a known <laughs> error in the record that they submitted. If not, we'll see this pass, voted on the Senate floor, but someone purposefully did not fill out uh, uh, their responses with truth and integrity. Thank you, Senator. And uh, with all due respect, and I, and I say that uh, uh, as well as I can, I'm going to consider it simply a motion to again put this off. And we've done that eight times. Uh, there's been every possible reason given, and I'm just not going to take any more motions on it. I'm going to declare it out of order. Um, but uh, and, and, it's time and we got to a vote on this. And then may I just conclude, for my record at least, for my own uh, 
uh, just sense of fellowship here around this table that I am not at all asking for this vote to be postponed. That's good. I want to say clearly for the record, I, I, the vote will go forward. I am not, for the record, asking for this vote to be postponed. I am simply asking for an affirmation of sentiment that the people around this table, as a, as a nod to the comedy and the goodwill uh, of this body, that we just believe people should respond truthfully and accurately when a nominee sub answers uh, QFR's questions for the record. Thank you, Senator. You've made your record. On, on, is there, on, on is there, is there, the Chairman, on Senator Booker. Sen please, I'm, Senator, don't interrupt me. I'm speaking. trying to uh, attract your attention in order to be recognized. You're recognized. Thank you. Senator Booker's um, motion is not to postpone. It's to condition the reporting out of the nominee. And that that condition be, if the majority decides to vote out the nominee, that it be conditioned, that the recommendation to the Senate is that it not proceed to a floor vote until the appropriate documentation and changes have been made. That, that's not a postponement of the moment. That is a conditioning. I think it is totally appropriate. I hear your argument, Senator. I'm going to use the prerogative of the chair to declare that it is indeed uh, a uh, vote, uh, a motion to postpone. So further debate. There being no further debate, the question before the committee is, shall uh, Michael Pack be uh, uh, sent to the floor with a uh, con uh, with a recommendation that he be confirmed. Clerk will call the roll. No. No, by proxy. No, by proxy. I. The uh, motion has passed on a vote of uh, 12 to 10, uh, and uh, Mr. Packer, we sent to the floor. I, uh, I will sign the. Uh, the document. We have a before us uh, a, an en blanc package of uh, 15 bills that have been agreed to. Uh, I'm certainly willing to uh, send them out. Uh, if anyone has an objection, they should uh, so state and we'll adjourn the meeting. Otherwise, uh, I would entertain a motion to send the uh, uh, en blanc uh, package out. And uh, as amended uh, by the amendments that have been identified in that list. Uh, so the, this was a bipartisan uh, agreement, uh, long negotiated, and because of the fact that we've had the, the COVID issue, that's why the list is so long. But we're, we'll, I'll certainly entertain a motion, but uh, again, uh, we may be too far run down to take it. Mr. Chairman. Senator Menendez. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, my question goes to how do you intend to deal with all of the, piece, the pieces of legislation that are not in your proposed end block uh, grouping? Well, we'll get to them as soon as we can, Senator. I, I, uh, do, you don't intend to pursue them today, uh, it, even though you've listed uh, No, them. these are the ones that are agreed to. There are others. The, the, the staffs have gone back and forth and reached an agreement on these 15. Uh, the others there was no agreement on. Uh, we have a vote starting in about one minute, so I don't intend to take them up today, but I do intend to have a business meeting as soon as we can to take these up. I know you have uh, uh, legislation, others have legislation. We've got some really important things. Uh, I, I'm anxious to get to a, a, a discussion of the COVID uh, situation. It's right in our wheelhouse at being a, a, a global problem, but I, I, we just can't do it today, Senator. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would just say, I, I see that you noticed them, so I understand the en bloc ones, but it was my uh, assumption and other members who prepared amendments that they were going to move forward with calling up the non en bloc pieces of legislation and then letting members offer an amendment and then creating final votes on that. So right. even though you noticed it, you're not going to pursue, well, pursue we them today. We're, we're out of time, so number one. Number well, two, we could return it is, after the vote. So. It is not my intent to block any amendments. I, I want 
people to have the opportunity to call up their amendments, to debate the amendments, and vote on the amendments. But these these 15 have no amendments, and uh, other than amendments that have been agreed to, and uh, uh, so I, I have this here. But look, I'll. I'll uh, I'll proceed how you want, but we're out of time since we Mr. do have to. Mr. Chairman, so I just Senator Senator Carter, and, and I'm I'm for the 15, and I'm glad we can move them forward. I'm very disappointed. There's some others that we're not going to be able to move. Where I think there's broad consensus, and if we had more committee time, we would be able to get them done today. It's been a long time since we've had a business meeting. I wanted to have some discussions in regards to some of the issues that are not on the agenda, and I've talked to you about that. I just think. Now it's going to be at least two weeks before we have another business meeting. We're not going to be in next week. Some of these issues are very timely, such as what's going on in Afghanistan and what's going on in Cuba. There's, these are not inconsequential areas of concern. I would just ask the chairman to consider a time that we can have another business meeting and not be subjected to one member blocking us from being able to take up a bill where even when we take up the bill with one member not being in total accord, usually by the end of the business meeting, we have total consensus. And we're not going to be able to do that today because of lack of time. I share your, I share your frustration. What happened to the Republicans? I have I have 12 members in the room right now. The motion is to is there a motion to adopt the in banc? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, this Senator Kane, yeah. if could you specify? I came prepared to talk about 20 bills today, so I don't know which are the ones that are in the in banc list. So the, the, if you could just if you could just read the bill numbers. I will. I will, and I I appreciate that. I'm not trying to pull anything here. I want I want everybody to have an understanding. These this was circulated amongst the staff and negotiated amongst staff. It's Senate Bill 238, Senate Bill 712, Senate Bill 3176, uh, HR 192, Senate Res 567, Senate Res 148, Senate Res 392, Senate Res 406, Senate Res 454, Senate Res 502, Senate Res 511, Senate Res 2 uh, 523, Senate Res 525. Uh, Senate Res 533 and Senate Res 542. Senator Merkley. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask to be asked, added as a co-sponsor of the uh, resolution supporting the Southeast Asian nations, uh, supporting the U.S. role in the Vaccine Alliance, and supporting the goals of International Women's Day. I I'm sorry, Senator. I, I didn't understand. Are you asking for a unanimous consent or a or no. co-sponsor? Yes, I'm asking unanimous consent to be added as a co-sponsor of those three items. There, if there's no objection, you'll be added. Thank you. All right. Um, has there been a motion made, uh, Clerk, on the on to adopt the? Uh, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there a second? second. Anybody object to moving forward on the en banc list with amendments? There being none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The en banc list has been adopted. The committee is adjourned.